Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director for the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the Southern Regional Council, University of Georgia Libraries, Piedmont College, home of the Lillian Smith Center, and the DeKalb County Public Library, welcome to the 2020 presentation of the Lillian Smith Book Award at the Decatur Book Festival. Thank you so much for allowing us to come into your homes this afternoon. I, of course, would like to thank the DeKalb Library Foundation, who pays for the Zoom account that we are broadcasting to you live right now. Just a few reminders this afternoon. If you would like to purchase copies of the book, the links to Karis Books and More, the local independent bookstore who is providing books for this event, are provided for you. You can just click on those links and order copies of each of the books. I'd also like to remind you that if you have questions for either of the recipients this afternoon, to go ahead and type your questions into the chat. And then once our presentation is done, I will of course read those questions and our uh, panelists will present the answers to you. I would also like to remind you that since it is a Lillian Smith themed weekend, that if you would like this afternoon for a few minutes to watch the wonderful Lillian Smith documentary by Hal and Henry Jacobs, Lillian Smith Breaking the Silence, that link is also provided to you in the chat as well. It's an amazing documentary that we had the opportunity to debut last May at the Decatur Library, and it has been shown around the United States. Uh, and it truly just shows what an amazing and trailblazing woman Lillian Smith was, and for her namesake, why this award is aptly named. I would also like to draw your attention to, of course, the Decatur Book Festival. The Decatur Book Festival is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year. And although due to the global pandemic, we have to present the programs virtually, the schedule is absolutely amazing and it reflects the 15 years that the Decatur Book Festival has invested into building a literary community right here in the state of Georgia and throughout the Southeast. So if you go to their website, decaturbookfestival.com, you can find many of the programs there, such as programs by Tony Tipton Martin, Dr. David Satcher, the Surgeon General of the United States, Dave Edgars, former U.S. Poet Laureate Natasha Trethaway, and current Georgia Poet Laureate Chelsea Rathburn. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that although we are not physically gathering in downtown Decatur enjoying all of the wonderful scenery, the bookstores, the restaurants, we still do need your help. There are costs, of course, associated with putting on events like this, marketing costs, staff costs, and of course, buying the platforms and able to present these to you. And in order for the Decatur Book Festival to come back next year physically and stronger than ever, we do need your help. So I encourage you to donate, if you can, to the Decatur Book Festival so we can continue into our 16th year and beyond. A couple of other notes that I would like to draw your attention to for this year is that we have a brand new logo designed by Jerry Wilson and new trophies for the recipients. Um, due to shipping and mailing issues that we all are encountering throughout the United States right now, those are not with us yet. However, I can tell you that this wonderful mock-up made by Nate Nardi at Decatur Glassblowing um, is complete. You can see the beautiful logo with Lillian Smith staring out at us all um, is embossed into the glass and they will be set atop bases and with the engraved plaques once we receive them. They will also have brand new gold medallion stickers that we will put on the books, much like some of the books all Georgians should read stickers that you see behind me. Um, and we will deliver those to Karis Books. So if you order copies through them, they will bear the new Lillian Smith book logo. Once again, I like to thank you all for inviting us into your homes, for celebrating the remarkable work by these two authors and continuing to celebrate the legacy of Lillian Smith. I would like to turn our program over now to Charles S. Johnson to speak to you a little more about our recipients and Lillian Smith herself. Charles? Good afternoon. I'm Charles Johnson. I'm president of the Southern Regional Council on behalf of the council and its partners. I want to welcome you to this 52nd annual and first ever virtual presentation of the Lillian Smith Book Award. Let me begin by providing a little context. In the years just after the Second World War, uh, when others were trying a cautious course on racial things, calling for a more humane treatment within a segregated system, Lillian Smith, nearly alone among a 
Halloween, boldly and persistently articulated in entirely different ways, so they completely desegregated itself. And following her death in 1966, the Southern Regional Council established an annual award in her name to recognize authors whose work carries on the tradition of William Smith, work of outstanding moral vision and literary merit which honestly portrays the South, its people, its problems, and its country. And for the last several years, this award has been presented as a partnership between the Southern Regional Council, which established the award, the University of Georgia Libraries, which housed the Williamson paper, the Georgia Center for the Book, which presents the Decatur Book Festival, and Piedmont College, which operates the Williamson Center in Clayton, Georgia. And there are a few, there are many people who have a hand in bringing this event to you every year, but I want to give special recognition to our heroic and distinguished panel of jurors who worked their way through the 44 books that were now in the year. They include from Morehouse College, Dr. Vicki Crawford, from the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia, Merrill Penson, from the Atlanta Fulton Public Library System, James Taylor, also from Morehouse College, Dr. E. Dolores Stephen, and our chair from Clark Atlanta University, Mary Quine Baker. Please join me in thanking the jurors. Now, this year's award recipients are very much in the tradition of our previous honorees. Dr. Giovanni Favors received his master's degree and PhD at the Ohio State University. He is currently an assistant professor of history at Clayton State University. We honor him for today for his distinguished book, Shelter in a Time of Storm how black colleges foster generations of leadership and activism. Now we live in a time when some are only now discovering the existence of historically black colleges and universities due to the role that one of them played in the life of our current Democratic Vice Presidential nominee. But few you know of the singular effectiveness which these institutions have achieved in producing scholars and leaders from some of the nation's most underrepresented communities. You will still know what Dr. Faber's book illustrates, and that is the role that these institutions have played in reinforcing a sense of community and launching the African American freedom struggle, struggle in the larger civil rights movement. Dr. Brandon K. Winfrey received his undergraduate and master's degrees from North Carolina Central University and his doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is currently an assistant professor of history at the University of Tennessee. We honor him today for his exceptional book, John Kirby Wheeler, Black Banking and the Economic Struggle for Civil Rights. This book tells another underrepresented story of how economic concerns shape the objective of the Black Freedom Struggle, as illustrated by the life of one of the leading rights of one of the country's best known black authors. So you've heard enough from me. Let's hear from our audience. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Jelani Taylor, recipient of the 2020 William Smith Book Award for his book, Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and Activism. Dr. Taylor. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is very much an unprecedented situation, um, but I am extremely grateful um, to be here. As was mentioned earlier, um, like so many others, I am very much missing uh, the Decatur Book Festival, but uh, as we struggle with these unprecedented times, uh, we have to make adjustments. And so I'm, I'm extremely happy um, to be here um, and overjoyed um, to be named a co-recipient of this year's 2020 Lillian Smith Book Award. I want to thank the University of Georgia Libraries, uh, Southern Regional Council, Georgia Center uh, for the Book, as well as Piedmont College. Um, I also want to recognize the legacy of, of Lillian Smith. Um, it's always great when people recognize um, your work or your contributions to the field. 
Uh, but it, it, it is even more significant when um, you can receive an award that bears the namesake of someone who was truly a freedom fighter, someone who was truly outspoken, and someone who stood in the gap when it was extremely unpopular to, to do, uh, and to uh, stand up for humanity, stand up for human rights, stand up uh, for democracy and justice for all. So uh, I'm extremely and deeply honored um, to be the recipient of this year's 2020 uh, Lillian Smith uh, Book Award. And thank you for having me. Um, like so many Black folks in this country, I am the product of a historically black college and university, also known as an HBCU. Uh, these institutions have served as the cornerstones of the black liberation movement, producing ministers, producing teachers, producing uh, lawyers and doctors, um, but also producing activists, uh, as well as professions of every kind. Uh, I myself, I am a proud graduate, as you heard of North, actually, it wasn't mentioned that I was a graduate of North Carolina a t State University, only the Ohio State University, but I'm, I, I began my intellectual roots uh, at North Carolina a t State University, uh, where I graduated from there in 1997. Um, but on February the 1st, 1960, uh, four freshman students uh, sat down at a Woolworths counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in doing so, um, they launched the direct phase of the modern, direct action phase of the modern civil rights movement. Uh, and this is a movement, um, this is a, uh, a development, uh, political and social development, which still reverberates throughout our country uh, to this very day. Uh, I finished ANT in 1997, and it was then that uh, I made my way to Columbus, Ohio to go to graduate school at, uh, again, the Ohio State University. I began in, in the master's program in African American studies, uh, and I came under the tutelage of Dr. William Nelson, Jr. Um, now, when I was at ANT, we talked a lot about the sit-ins. We talked a lot about the civil rights movement. And when I arrived at Ohio State, I, I didn't really want to continue down that path. That was something that I thought that I had exhausted, but it was Dr. Nelson uh, who actually first encouraged me to uh, take a second look, to dig deeper, and that indeed the story of student activism had never really been fully told. And so I began to do that. I did a master's thesis uh, under his direction, uh, and then I came across the street to the history department uh, where I began my PhD uh, in history in, in 2000. Uh, and it was there in that program uh, that I took a class under Dr. Beverly Gordon uh, at Ohio State University. And it was entitled The History of Black Education. Uh, and that was one of the most profound, one of the most impactful classes uh, that I ever took. Uh, it was in that class that Dr. Gordon introduced us to scholars such as V.P. Franklin, scholars such as James Anderson, uh, who wrote the incredibly classic and, and incredibly important book, uh, the, uh, the History of, of Blacks in Higher Education. But she also introduced me to the work of, of Vanessa Siddle Walker. Vanessa Siddle Walker, ironically, won this award last year uh, for her book, for her book uh, The Lost Education of Horace Tate. All these scholars and so many more uh, made an extreme impact on my understanding on the history of black education. Um, but the holes and the voids that they were filling um, dealt with uh, mostly the legacy and the role of black teachers. Um, and it led me to raise, to, to raise a question. Well, if these teachers are making such a profound impact and effect, how do we get these teachers? Who trained these teachers? Uh, and that was a, a story which I believe had not truly been filled. Um, enter one of the most important mentors uh, in my life, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, uh, who came to Ohio State around the same time that I was beginning my PhD program. And Dr. Jeffries served as an incredible mentor for me uh, and encouraged me to take a much stronger look uh, at the role of black colleges and institutions. In fact, before I left uh, to go to Mississippi, uh, to begin my, my research, a uh, comparative study of Tougaloo and Jackson State, it was Dr. Jeffries who told me that the historian's job is to get the reader to rethink what they thought they already knew, right? To rethink what you thought 
you already knew. And again, so many historians and scholars had attempted to, uh, to tell the story of black colleges through the same old lenses of classism and conservatism and uh, paternalism and colorism. All these things certainly existed on black college campuses, but none of that, none of those things answered the questions of how do we get someone like an Ella Baker? How do we get someone like a Stokely Carmichael? How do we get someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Ruby Dora Smith or Diane Nash? How do we produce these type of activists? Because all of them, their roots are within historically black colleges. And so I began to dig deeper and I went down into Mississippi uh, and it was there that I immediately began to get the answer to my question. Uh, I came across uh, in the Jackson State University newspaper of 1945, I came across uh, the writings of a woman by the name of Onesma May Clark. And as I often joke with people, that's as Southern and as Mississippi as you're gonna get right there, Onesma May Clark. Um, but she offered this very profound and beautiful prayer for the class of 1945. And this is what she said in that prayer. She said, quote, Grant us, O oh God, the ability as prospective teachers to inspire instead of to discourage, to give light where there is darkness, to help where it is needed, and to fight for justice for all. I'll say that again, to fight for justice for all. Unless, O oh God, we're able to do these things, there will be so few leaders and great men and women of tomorrow that the progress of our race will be impeded. Today we launch, O oh God, teach us how to sail and where to anchor. That was in 1945. I, can, I continued to pour through the student newspapers of Jackson State University and Tougaloo College, and I continued to receive an abundance of evidence pointing to the politicization and even radicalization of Black youth during this era. And again, this is a story which really had not been told. I came across the words of Johnny Edwards, who again offered a conclusion um, for me in terms of really sealing the fact that these institutions were planting seeds of activism and agency amongst these youth. Johnny Edwards said this in 1949 as a graduate of Jackson State University. He says, we are moving forward to serve humanity and we have been thoroughly oriented in how to solve our own problems. For our teacher training, our teacher training has been directed towards social ends, that is, toward the perpetuation, progress, and welfare of all men. We realize that the educational objectives that we now possess should become consciously into integrated with all social organization to the end that the educational objectives may determine the direction of social change, whereby all men would reap the benefits of our democratic society direction of social change, reaping the benefits of a democratic society. This is what students and, and young people who attended these institutions were saying in the 1940s in the belly of the beast, Mississippi, right? in, in, in the sweltering, oppressive environment of Mississippi. But again, as I came across these students, the next question became, well, who was teaching them? Right? And so I began to uncover the works and the writings of people like, like Octavius Caddo at Cheney State University, which began as the Institute for Colored Youth, people like Fannie Jackson Coppin, uh, people like Margaret Walker uh, and Jane McAllister at Jackson State University, people such as Joanne Robinson at Alabama State University and the president of Alabama State University, uh, Harper Council Trenholm. These people acted again as mentors, uh, as, as, as seed planters, uh, as they began to engage with Black youth. Uh, and they promoted what I refer to in my work as the second curriculum, uh, which is a curriculum which is not like math or Latin or Greek or, or, or biology, um, but this was a curriculum deeply rooted in what I refer to as racial consciousness, idealism, and cultural nationalism. These were the three things that I continue to see over and over again continue to blossom on these institutions. And it was, again, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, who strongly encouraged me when I finished my PhD in 2006 to try to <clears throat> take on this extremely 
long, ambitious project of telling a broader story of the legacy and the role of historically black colleges and universities. So I added to that study, not two, not three, but seven institutions to try to fill in that gap. When I was a student at North Carolina a and as an undergraduate, we had a conference in the history department known as Missing Pages. And that's exactly what I tried to do with my, 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 my research and this monograph is to fill in those missing pages of historically black colleges to help us understand how through the, the agency and through the proliferation of the second curriculum, uh, black students were exposed to a long history of race consciousness and idealism and cultural nationalism. Over and over again, students were talking about citizenship and democracy. They were being drilled in it, trained in it, um, during an era where black folks were constantly denied citizenship and democracy. Uh, and so this, these were the intellectual roots, the seeds of my book. And again, I began um, this project. I received tremendous support um, from Duke University, uh, who invested in this project not once but twice um, with a fellowship to help me bring it um, to its fruition. Uh, and in last year, 2019, um, this book finally came to life, Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and Activism, Telling the Story of seven historically black colleges and universities. The, the Institute for Colored Youth, also known as Cheney State University, founded in 1837, is where I began my story. I continued also by telling, uh, retelling the story of Tougaloo during the nadir. Uh, I moved forward from there to tell the st story of Bennett College, uh, one of two single sex institutions dedicated to educating African-American women. From there, I told the story of three institutions in the midst of this uh, world post-World War II environment, which I felt was the largest gap in our understanding. So between the 1930s through the 1950s, that story really had not been filled in. So I attempted to tell that story by looking at the roles of Jackson State University, looking at the roles of Alabama State University, and the role played by Southern University. And then I conclude um, by telling the story of what William Chase said was the center of the Black power movement in the South, Greensboro, North Carolina, by looking at, looking at it um, through the lens of North Carolina Anti-State University, my alma mater. And then I conclude with my epilogue, um, which tries to make sense and bring the story full circle. It was truly uh, an, a labor of love uh, and uh, an emphasis on labor. Um, so I'm extremely uh, grateful that uh, the Lillian Smith Book Award and the jurors of the Lillian Smith Book Award looked upon this book very favorably, uh, who truly believed that I was indeed filling in a missing page, a page which informs us of our past, but also gives us an understanding of our present as well. What role can these institutions still play, still serve? Uh, and continuing to plant seeds of agency amongst its students. We are living in a very um, tense moment um, where once again, white supremacy, racism, racial violence uh, is very much uh, uh, appearing on the scene in the same ways in which it has appeared in past generations. What answers uh, can these institutions provide for us as we continue to move forward? And I hope that this book will answer that uh, in some ways, uh, again, not just telling the story of the past, but also highlighting what the, the, the ultimate question of what now? How do we address these issues that are continuing to plague us? And I do believe that the history and legacy of black colleges hold some answers to how we can address this by continuing to develop students like Oneza May Clark and Johnny Edwards and the countless other students who emerged from these institutions uh, and, and declare that they were going to be agents of change. Um, thank you once again to the Lillian Smith Book Award. Um, thank you to the jurors. Uh, and I'm extremely, again, grateful to be this year's honoree uh, for the Lillian Smith Book Award. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Favors, and congratulations again. It's, it's now my pleasure to present to you Dr. Brandon K. Winford, recipient of the 2020 Lillian Smith Book Award for this book, John Harvey Wheeler, Black Banking and the Economic Struggles of Civil Rights. Dr. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, 
what Dr. Favor said, uh, such profound and, and inspirational words. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that kind introduction, Mr. Johnson. And I definitely appreciate you all for taking time out of your Sunday to be here today. Let me just begin by giving thanks. Uh, thank you first uh, to God for continuing to bless me and guide me on this journey, for continuing to grant me boldness, determination, courage, and vision in my life. Uh, in the book's uh, acknowledgement section, I tried as best I could to uh, show my appreciation to everyone that had a hand in helping me figure out uh, what this book was about. Uh, but let me just sort of thank a, a few people. Thank you first to the entire team at the University Press of Kentucky, especially acquisitions editor and Dean Dotson, uh, who was acquisitions editor at the time, who made publishing my first book such a wonderful experience all around. Uh, the press was always transparent and responsive to uh, all of my questions and concerns individually. Uh, the Civil Rights and Struggle for Black Equality in the 20th Century series edited by Cynthia Griggs Fleming, Stephen F. Lawson, and uh, Dr. Favors' uh, mentor, Hassan Kwame Jeffrey. So you can see all the connections uh, that historians uh, have with one another, right? And the support that we all uh, get from one another. Uh, that series has been an excellent uh, series in terms of helping to shape the field of African-American history. Also, thank you to my family, friends, and colleagues uh, for your support and encouragement. Uh, I would especially like to thank my wife, Ebony Winford, uh, who, uh, even going back to my dissertation and, and drafts of the book, uh, also has a PhD in psychology, uh, gave me uh, really good feedback from uh, copy editing and uh, just sort of lighting a fire under me when I was lagging a little bit in terms of uh, getting the work done. Uh, thank you also, uh, finally, to the award selection committee and the sponsors of the Lillian E. Smith Book Award. Uh, and these include the University of Georgia Libraries, the Southern Regional Council, the Georgia Center for the Book, and the DeKalb Public Library at Piedmont, in, uh, in Piedmont College. Uh, let me say that at the University of Tennessee, I have established a, uh, or I've co-founded, uh, the Fleming Morrow Endowment in African American History, named in honor of two pioneer historians, uh, Cynthia Griggs Fleming, who uh, is a professor emerita at the University of Tennessee, and um, Dr. John H. Morrow Jr., who is actually a, a professor at the University of Georgia. Uh, we're always looking for uh, support uh, to continue the work of African American history. Uh, like Dr. Favors noted, um, historically black colleges are vitally important. Uh, I graduated from North Carolina Central University, uh, which in North Carolina is a rival to a and State University, uh, but I'm honored to receive this award alongside Professor Favors. And let me read, uh, just to give you a sense of how important these institutions are, I want to read a little bit from my acknowledgement section where I thank some of the uh, my mentors at North Carolina Central University. Uh, the journey into the historical profession began at my alma mater, North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. These professors and mentors are a part of my extended Eagle family because they taught me to soar and always demonstrated a genuine concern to their students. Thanks to Carlton Wilson, Dr. Jerry Gershenhorn, or Drs. Carlton Wilson, Jerry Gershenhorn, Freddie Parker, Jim Harper, Lydia Lindsay, Percy Murray, Henry Louis Suggs, Bayuna Muhammad, and the late Ronaldo Lawson, the late Sylvia M. Jacobs introduced her students to the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and I am forever grateful for her, to her for doing so. And I share this alongside a great group of other colleagues and friends trained at the Sloping Hills, the Burden Green. This is a special honor, given that this award was established by the Southern Regional Council in 1966 following Smith's death. The Southern Regional Council is an organization that I spent a lot of time researching and learn of, learning about because it was one of the organizations among many that John Herbert Wheeler worked so closely with uh, since its founding in 1944. His involvement in that organization began with him serving as vice president, as a member of his executive board, chairman of the executive board, and at the same time held an executive position with the North Carolina's, of North, with the North Carolina's affiliate SRC organization, uh, the uh, North Carolina Council on Human Relations. And in 1963, over the course of several months, a three-person committee recommended John Wheeler for election at the annual conference 
to become the next president of the Southern Regional Council to replace outgoing President James McBride Dabbs. The annual conference was, conference was planned for the week of November 22nd, 1963, and actually had to be, be, be postponed after uh, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. So John Herbert Wheeler began his tenure as Southern Regional Council President in January 1964. He served until 1969 and was in fact president of the organization in 1966 when uh, this book award was established. A long list of black leaders led in the Southern Regional Council's inception from organizing meetings in Durham, North Carolina, October 20th, 1942, to Atlanta, Georgia, and Richmond, Virginia in 1944, in, Southern Regional, in the Southern Regional Council's transition from the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. Around the same time that the Southern Regional Council began, it did not take a public stance against segregation. It was folk like Lillian Smith, among others, who were very vocal. In the words of the Southern Regional Council's first executive director, Guy Benton Johnson, in a 1968 account of the organization's history, quote, our good friend Lillian Smith signed in with supporting statement in favor of taking a public stance against segregation, indicating that she would hold aloof from the Southern Regional Council until it came clean on the issue of segregation. And it wasn't until 1951 that the Southern Regional Council released a public statement titled The South of the Future, where the organization denounced segregation. And I believe this statement still is still relevant for us today. It says, quote, the South of the future is a South freed of stultifying inheritances from the past. It is a South where the measure of a man will be his ability, not his race, where a common citizenship will work in democratic understanding for the common good, where all who labor will be rewarded in proportion to their skill and achievement, where all can feel confident of a personal safety and equality before the law, where there will exist no double standard in housing, health, education, and other public services. Through the Southern Regional Council, John Herbie Wheeler mentored people like John, uh, Vernon E. Jordan Jr., the second director of the Voter Education Project, who thankfully was one of the individuals who wrote a blurb of uh, the book, John Herbie Wheeler, Black Banking and the Economic Struggle for Civil Rights, alongside Drs. Charles W. McKinney Jr. and Jerry Gershenhorn. Jordan said of, of John Wheeler, quote, or he said that John Wheeler, quote, like the Southern Regional Council, because it was an organization based in research and the research that it did, it dispensed throughout the South and it helped people think about the issues in ways that they had not thought about the issues before. If one were going to be an advocate, Jordan continued, you had to have information and your information had to be accurate and right. And this advocacy by uh, the council and his research had impact. In the last decade of his life, John Wheeler counseled that, quote, the best tactics are to work through the courts, become involved in politics, and use organized pressure. I didn't set out to write a book about civil rights and black business history. In my naivete, I felt like civil rights history had already been done, right? Uh, but how untrue that was. Uh, John Wheeler was such a uh, interesting figure to explore and learn about his life because uh, during at the height of the civil rights, modern civil rights movement in the mid 20th century South, John Herbie Wheeler had his hands in everything related to civil rights and black business history, right? He was a, a kind of a behind the scenes a power broker, someone who was not necessarily out front uh, in the ways that we tend to think about civil rights leadership. Uh, and so this book really only captures a small, very small crumb of Wheeler's larger story. And I was thankful that uh, the Robert W. Woodruff Library at the Atlanta University Center, uh, who received the uh, collection, the Wheeler, John Harvey Wheeler papers in 1979. So from 1979 all the way through 2006, those papers had sat in the uh, archives of the library. And it was in 2006 that I had the opportunity to begin to explore those materials. And uh, the archives, the head arch archivist allowed me to go into the collection for the first time. And it was a 10 year period between 2006 and 2016 before those materials were uh, fully processed and open uh, to researchers. And so I was so very thankful uh, to have the support of archives, especially um, our archives at our historical black colleges and universities uh, hold a significant amount of, of research 
uh, and materials uh, that are rich in helping us uncover and continue to tell these stories. In this book, I try to capture um, the approach that John Hervey Wheeler took to his civil rights activism. Uh, John Wheeler argued, and his career in activism demonstrates uh, this idea of what I like to call New South prosperity. In other words, New South prosperity was this idea that full citizenship, racial equality, and civil rights were actually the prerequisites for Black economic power. Uh, economic independence, like so many people had argued in the first few decades of the 20th century, was not possible from John Wheeler's perspective until they also, until they first had citizenship rights. All right, more importantly, uh, John Wheeler felt that black economic power was crucial in, in order for the South to advance materially when compared to other regions. Wheeler navigated and sought to fulfill the ideas of New South prosperity through what I like to call black business activism. He's used his economic sense as a black banker, his legal skills as a civil rights lawyer to fight through the courts. He utilized organizational pressure and advocated black political participation to bring about the kind of change he envisioned. One of his favorite quotes and refrains, right, I think it's vitally important um, when we think about the, the political, the new political age that we're in now. He said, quote, the battle for freedom begins every morning. And essentially what that meant was the struggle for freedom and citizenship was something that was continuous. It was something that was not gonna happen overnight. And once you worked on a particular issue and felt that you had achieved and solved that problem, you still had to put your clothes on the next day. You had to get up the next morning, the next day, because there was always another issue that needed to be addressed. So when I look at the life of John Wheeler, it definitely captures the essence of that motto uh, that he lived by. And I think it, there are, are significant lessons for us in this uh, in understanding the story of, of John Herbie Wheeler. Let me close by, again, thanking the Lillian Smith Book Award Selection Committee and all of the sponsors for uh, this very uh, important and, and heartfelt recognition. I'm honored to have uh, my name mentioned alongside so many great historians and other authors, including Professor Favors, whose work has helped move this narrative forward in profound ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctors Favors and Winford, for those wonderful speeches and things for us to think about. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to go ahead and type it into the chat, and I will go ahead and read it and let our panelists answer. Uh, right now, gentlemen, as everyone's typing, um, what I was really struck by um, in both of your acceptance speeches, and, and you know, Dr. Flavors said this in his about rethinking what we already know. And I think because of the Lillian Smith Award and how important it is, and of course, in the current times we're living in, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, we as students, when we were in high school and then in college, were sometimes given such a very capsule, um, almost bullet pointed history of African American history, of Black history. You know, how important is it that these stories um, and almost like these, these hidden gems of Black history are brought to the forefront? And, you know, how can we make sure that we are always rethinking what we already know? That it is not just, um, you know, our history education doesn't get left our senior year in high school or once we complete a certain level of course study in college that that we continue to look for these histories and to continue to rethink and reframe those histories yeah great question thank you for the question you know i think that one of the things um that struck me about um this research on historically black colleges and universities is how deliberate and intentional they were uh, in their curriculum, uh, in their development of young race men and race women. And I think that we have to be very deliberate and, and intentional about how we approach filling in these gaps. Again, you know, my, my mentor, Dr. Jeffries, he talks about this hard history and how we have to be willing to understand and engage with this hard history. Well, generations of African-American students were very much exposed to this hard history. They weren't exposed to this disnification 
of, of American life. They weren't exposed to this uh, um, a, a, a false mythical nature of who we were, of who we were as a nation. Um, they were exposed to, to the truth about who we were as a country. But more importantly, they were taught and trained um, to be agitators um, for justice. To, to move forward and to fully address um, these issues. Again, you don't have someone like John Harvey Wheeler, Wheeler unless you have a Morehouse, right? And, and so again, it was, he was, this is one of the components of that set curriculum, cultural nationalism. He was shaped by that environment. He was taught to be a very proud race man. And then of course he carried that on to North Carolina Central University. Uh, and, and so we have to be very deliberate and intentional about how we engage young people training them, educating them, highlighting them, uh, uh, highlighting them to the truths about who we are uh, as a nation, and in doing so, uh, empower them um, with the ability to move forward as, as change agents. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Um, and of course, the question was for our other panelists, just to restate, um, it was about Dr. Favors mentioning uh, rethinking what we already knew and how important it is to continually search African American history, Black history, and for the next generation and for ourselves to really rethink and reframe that history. If, if I may real quickly, I often uh, think of history and uh, when I'm uh, beginning to uh, teach history in a particular course, one of the first things I do with students is to have them think about history in terms of it being a puzzle. In other words, uh, when we open up the puzzle, the box, there are all these pieces, thousands of pieces, but there is uh, a cover image uh, that we're supposed to fit all these pieces in. And so what I like to think of history is, in terms of what we know coming into it, is we have uh, this idea of the cover images of history, right? This is what we know about history. And what my job is to break down that puzzle and get students to think about uh, how those pieces fit together, think about the different, different versions of, in terms of the historical context, and then beginning to question, interrogate, and think about how do all of these pieces actually fit in order to come together to fit this broader cover image of history. And once we're uh, done sort of peeling back those layers and bringing the puzzle together, uh, students should have some new revelations, some understanding of what they knew and what they thought about history uh, and then bringing into uh, that understanding what they've learned anew. And I think that's the power and transformative uh, impact that, that history can actually have. Excellent, thank you so very much. So we do have a few questions um, in the chat. So I will go ahead and read those to you. Um, Merrill writes to Dr. Favors, how many students are attending non-HBCU colleges? Without that kind of mentorship and curriculum you describe at HBCUs, how will we get the civil rights leaders of the future? Are there lessons your research has for all of higher education? Yeah, that's, I mean, well, certainly there's a ton of, of folks who, who the majority of, of, of black students in this country now no longer attend historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and what they have attempted to do is to carve out space, space at Ohio State University, where I went to grad school, space at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, space at, U space at UCLA, space at all of these predominantly white institutions where they can thrive and exist and be unapologet unapologetically Black. Uh, and, and what many of them are discovering, increasingly um, discovering, sadly, particularly in this era of heightened um, tension, uh, is that those spaces are not conducive uh, to, to, to sheltering them, to nurturing them, to providing them the type of support that they need. And thus, we are indeed beginning to see a small uptick uh, in the enrollment of historically black colleges. Uh, so I do think that predominantly white institutions, um, they are challenged uh, and they should be challenged to one, address their own racist histories as institutions uh, and understand the fact that black colleges and predominantly white institutions do not have the same origin story. Uh, they do not have the same path in terms of, of their curriculum. These are very distinct spaces. And I think that's important to acknowledge and to understand that the academy has played a critical role in producing racism and white supremacist uh, ideas within American society and, 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 and pushing those ideas forward. And the moment that the academy is ready to have a serious conversation and reckoning 
um, with their role uh, in, in producing uh, uh, racist ideas in America and racist policy in America, I think the better it will be for those students who attend those type of institutions, uh, both black, white, Asian, Hispanic, and, and otherwise. So um, you have to, as I said before, you have to be very deliberate and intentional about the space that you are carving out. Now, this is not suggesting that, and I say this in my work, in my research, certainly HBCUs were not um, some sort of uh, 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 perfect uh, space, uh, uh, utopian space, uh, where, again, the freedom dreams of black folks could run, not being exposed to classism and colorism and conservatism and all these other things. Uh, but what we do know is that out of these institutions sprung uh, a social movement. Uh, and that movement was powered by the humanities. Um, it was powered by, again, a relationship um, that was shared between administrators uh, and, and, and faculty and, and, and staff who, who lay their hands on these future, on these uh, uh, previous generations and molded them and shaped them. So again, that too has to be deliberate. That mentoring, partnering relationship has to be uh, uh, deliberate in an effort um, to create the future, right? Again, what Onesa May Clark said, that if I don't do it, right, you know, Praying, making that prayer, right? That, hey, if, if, if we don't do it, how are we going to get men and women of the future uh, who can go forward uh, and, 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 and move not just the race forward in terms of African Americans, but move our country forward uh, into a more inclusive, tolerant, um, uh, just filled world? Uh, and so I think that this is the question for all institutions uh, of higher learning. Uh, and, and again, we understand that white supremacy is systemic and it filters through almost every institution in America, our banking systems, our health systems, our school systems. Uh, and so we have to understand and root that out in a very deliberate way, but more importantly, train young people um, to, to highlight that, to look for that, and to be agents of change. Excellent, thank you, Professor Favors. And now we have one for uh, Dr. Winford. Um, everyone is being asked to vote as well they must, in the next election, but that's just one action. What specific advice do you think John Hervey Wheeler would provide to today's young activists, given the wealth of challenges Black Americans continue to have? I think that's a, a really powerful question. Uh, and let me just reiterate uh, that uh, I encourage all of you, please go out to vote. Uh, please uh, vote. Um, this is one of the most important presidential elections for sure. Um, and we're in a new sort of political age, right? We understand the connections to history uh, and the ways in which African-Americans in particular have, have had to fight up against these new political ages, whether we're talking about the late 19th, early 20th century with desegregate or we're talking about segregation, laws to uh, bring about segregation and to disfranchise African-Americans. African-Americans still up against those challenges fought uh, and, and, and challenged and resisted in all kinds of ways. And if they were, once they were uh, sort of moved out of traditional political uh, participation, they found other ways to be politically active. And so the vote is just one aspect of that. And John Herbie Wheeler, if, if no one else's life in, in activism really represents that, he was a chairman of the civil rights organization called the Durham Committee on Negro Affairs. It held a voting block in Durham, North Carolina and yielded a, a significant political power in North Carolina when it came to the vote. He was also involved uh, on the local, state, and national le level in civic uh, and local leadership, right? So once voting happens, right, there are all kinds of ways in which um, John Wheeler, I, I believe, would have encouraged uh, young activists to participate um, and find their passions and things that they're really sort of passionate about uh, and find a ways to fight those issues and uh, whether you're working through organizations whether you're a lawyer and working to, through the legal realm, um, whether you're an activist, there are all kinds of ways and organizations that are already out there that are doing the work that most of us are interested in, right? And so we look at the example of John Wheeler. Uh, he was the president of one of the largest black owned banks in the United States. He was a civil rights lawyer uh, and he was involved in organizations like the Southern Regional Council. And so he understood that in order to sort of reach these sort of greater uh, goals and objectives, uh, you had to vote, yes, but you also had to find and identify uh, other organizations and institutions and ways to sort of work um, within those entities, um, because those were the, the, those were the pathways to which uh, issues were going to be addressed. Uh, in particular, 
uh, John Freely was very interested and involved in um, working toward public policy. Uh, and we should understand that um, those issues are always connected to one another, right? Uh, but public policy is something I think he would encourage uh, activists to explore, uh, think about and consider ways to uh, bring about changes in public policy. When we think about vote, voting, yes, voting uh, matters. Uh, we think about sort of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Uh, once that was passed, millions and millions of African Americans now had the right to vote, which meant that when you voted, uh, political leaders had to now take your concerns and issues into consideration, right? And then we get the uh, significant and widespread election of black office holders. So voting matters from that, within that context, but there are also all kinds of ways in which once you vote, you have to move forward. And I think he would encourage African-Americans, uh, young activists in particular, to uh, get involved politically, uh, to use things like organized pressure, right? And also, uh, John Wheeler, although he was a part of a sort of traditional black leadership, and so they did things a bit within a very specific uh, framework, he also had to and was forced to embrace uh, student activists during the 1960s. And, and so I think it's also important uh, for young activists to uh, bring to the table um, their new and innovative ideas uh, and uh, challenge um, their elders uh, to, uh, to, to, to seek new ways. All right, and so those are some of the things that I would, I think he would say, um, he, would, he would also encourage uh, folks to uh, get their education uh, education was a pathway uh, to economic power, to citizenship, and in, in fullest extent of democracy. Thank you so very much. So I'm going to combine a couple of the questions that, that came through into sort of one larger question uh, about HBCUs. And these come from Dean Mavens, Nita, and Vicki. Um, and of course, in this combined question, they ask about the struggle to save Morris Brown. Um, what you both see as the future of HBCUs in the 21st century, and wouldn't they, the HBCUs, have trouble teaching critical race theory or the 1690 project um, as predominantly white institutions already have teaching those subjects? And would either of your careers and their trajectory be different had you not attended an HBCU? Um, Brandon, you want to jump in on that or you want me to start? <laughs> you can go. Okay, so for, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, I, I really don't, it's hard to put into to words what uh, my alma mater, North Carolina Anti State University, has, has meant to me. Um, this is probably something that Brandon doesn't know, uh, and I, I, I usually don't share it a lot, but, but my freshman year in college, I actually went to North Carolina Central. <laughs> so I attended North Carolina Central first before transferring to that rival institution, North Carolina a t State University. Uh, but I, I transferred to be closer to my mother after my father passed away um, suddenly um, in, in 1994. Um, and it was at North Carolina a t State University that I had faculty uh, who wrapped their arms around me at the most critical moment in my life where um, I often was depressed. I often um, um, wasn't sure about my future uh, as a student. Um, but as so many people say, and this is not just my testimony, this is the testimony of countless HBCU alumni. Uh, I had professors who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. Uh, and that relationship, it mattered. Not only that, but I was also in this radically black space um, that uh, uh, highlighted, highlighted so much of, of my history and my past and, and embedded that within me. Uh, and that's something that you can't really recreate. Um, at, at predominantly white institutions. As I said before, um, a, a number of black students carve out black student unions and uh, uh, even have their own separate black graduations at, at PWIs. Uh, and they do what they can to survive um, the racial hostilities that they encounter. Um, but it's something to be said um, for matriculating at an institution where um, that institution was founded for you. Uh, that it, its curriculum was developed to support you. 
and, and when I say you, I don't mean you as an individual, but you as a collective. So um, I thank God for our HBCUs. I thank God for North Carolina Anti State University. I thank God for North Carolina Central University. Um, these spaces have played a critical role in shaping who I am. Um, to, to address some of the other questions, I, I think one of the things that we have to remember about um, these generations that emerged out of black colleges is how deeply impacted they were by the humanities, um, by the social sciences. Um, over the last several years, I would dare say 20, 30, maybe even pull it back to 40 years, so many historically black colleges have now embraced these STEM fields. And as I often tell people when I talk about this, this is not to denigrate, denigrate STEM uh, as, as an emerging field, which certainly uh, is catering towards the interests of so many of our students. Uh, and we also realized that STEM, of course, on many of these institutions, at many of these institutions, it pays the bill. There's so much research dollars within these, within these uh, uh, new fields, and black colleges are starving for that type of, of financial support. But I want to point out something um, that was said in 1957 by Professor Rodney Higgins, um, who was a professor of political science at Southern University. Not only was he a professor of political science, but he was a founder of the political science program in, in, at Southern University. And that program went on to produce scores of, of Black political scientists, literally the first uh, um, um, National Council of Black Political Sciences or organization which is still alive today was founded on Southern University's campus. The first uh, meeting was founded on Southern University's, Southern University's campus. So, but this is Rodney Higgins in 1957 speaking at the National Council of the Social Studies in 1957. He says, quote, science and mathematics, important as they are, cannot provide solutions to many of the grave problems that we face today. The most serious issues of our time lie within the field of human affairs. For the solutions to these problems, we must look to the social sciences and humanities. That's from Rodney Higgins in 1957. I'll forward it to, fast forward it to 1981. Some of you may be familiar with the name of Gwen Patton. Gwen Patton, of course, is a very famous um, um, uh, civil rights activist who came out of Tuskegee in the 1960s, but she was interviewed in 1981 about her experiences at Tuskegee and how that space nurtured and shaped her. This is what she had to say uh, in, a, in an interview. She said, quote, a court, uh, she said, we read in, in Tuskegee, we read passages of Alexis de Tocqueville in history and political science classes. They read Gun Gunnar Merdahl in, in sociology class. They discussed Nietzsche, Aristotle, Hegel in philosophy classes. They studied the black giants in compulsory compulsory Negro history class. Many students read Facing Mount Kenya by uh, Nkrumah and Basil Davidson uh, and, and supplements to the Negro history class. They analyzed es essays of Ruskin and Macaulay uh, and Tom Paine in literature classes. They discussed the matters of the day, the Vietnam War, the draft with their colleagues, H. Rat Brown, Stokely Carmichael, Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Malcolm X, it should not have been baffling, uh, a baffling wonder to the administration and the faculty that Tuskegee Institute was producing critical thinkers in an age when critical decisions had to be made. Again, this shout out that Gwen Patton delivers to the humanities cannot be understated, right? And so when we look at the history programs, when we look at, 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 at black studies, when we look at women's studies and ethnic studies and all of these humanities programs that emerge uh, in the 1960s, one, we should understand that these type of efforts were already being filled in going back to the 1830s, 1840s, uh, when these institutions were first founded, they were creating a type of dedicated space where students could be exposed to this very powerful counter narrative bring this up to 2020, and again, STEM, as important as it is, how does it equip our students with the tools that are necessary to critique white supremacy, to deconstruct white supremacy, and to build in its place a more just and equitable society? And I think that it's, it's really difficult um, for those disciplines to fill that in. Therefore, we need black colleges to continue to support, to continue to finance uh, and, 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 and 
and, and, and bolster um, the humanities and social sciences at historically black colleges so we don't lose that legacy of activism, so we don't lose that legacy of agency. Uh, as I often say when I speak on this subject, talking about the legacy of black colleges, the most important contributions they have ever made uh, has been to serve as a catalyst for social and political and economic change within Black America. And I think it's important that HBCUs remember that. I think that it's important that HBCUs continue to build upon that um, for the future. Uh, because again, if we don't, um, then what does that say about the future of Black activism emerging out of these institutions? I, I have just uh, three points to add to that if I, if I can. Uh, first, um, as Professor Favors noted, uh, while uh, the majority of African Americans attending colleges uh, today are uh, attending historically white colleges and universities, uh, the large majority of African Americans who are going on to professional and graduate schools are coming still from historically black colleges and universities. So I think that's something that's important for us to sort of recognize in this conversation. Uh, when it comes to uh, schools like Morris Brown and, and in Knoxville, Knoxville College and others, uh, when we, we hear this news, this national news about these schools uh, struggling financially, understand that when we get this news, a lot of times it uh, can be too little too late. Uh, and so it's incumbent upon us to invest in to uh, support uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, I myself uh, give monthly to my alma mater, but also give to Bennett College and other institutions. And I think it's just a part of, of, of my responsibility uh, to give back to historically black colleges, especially given I know the impact that a school like North Carolina Central has made on me, a school like a &T, uh, has made on uh, other family members and relatives, Winston-Salem State, and the list goes on and on, uh, Johnson C. Smith University. I think it's also important, um, finally, in this, in this conversation, uh, for us to recognize the historic failures of the state and federal governments in its support of historically black colleges and universities. We have all these conversations or hear people say how much they're doing for historical black colleges today, but we have to reckon with the historic failures of being underfunded for decades and decades. We have to address in a, a reparative sense of this, these decades of underfunding of historical black colleges and universities on the one hand, and then we can sort of pick, pick up where we are and move them forward. But, but we have to deal with the, 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 the intentional uh, and um, the t intentional ways that these schools have been uh, really um, stymied, right, uh, in terms of the funding. So those are a few things that I wanted to add to what uh, uh, Jelani just said. Excellent. Thank you both so much. We have a, a few more questions before we wrap up. You all are making me work today. I've got like more notes scribbled than Barbara Walters during this whole thing. Um, but real quick before I get to those last few questions, there was a, a lovely um, comment from Yvonne um, who said that um, she is just so pleased to be part of the program today and to hear you both speak and that her father, her black historian father, graduated from Storer College um, that is now closed, I believe I read in the comments. So I do have a question. I'm gonna combine two questions real quick about, um, of course, history and teaching history and, and black history. And um, one question is, these are profound presentations that we have received today. Thank you so much to the Lillian Smith Book Awards for bringing your work to a larger public audience. May I ask our historians how they see this moment and this time in the United States history in this year of American history. And James furthers that question by saying, should we not seek to understand black history as it fits in with and combines with America's overall history in order to help shape that history as we move forward? Oh, without question, um, you know, and, and to, before I go on to answer that, that last question in terms of, um, the importance of black history. I want to shout out Storer College, um, which was mentioned uh, at the outset of that question. Um, I begin my book with the story of Storer College. Uh, Storer College, uh, you know, the title of this book is Shelter in a Time of Storm. And, and Storer College was, became the only place in, in America where the NAACP could hold its very first meeting on American soil. So that itself shows the importance 
of these institutions, black institutions matter. And Stora College at that very critical juncture uh, in the early 20th century, it mattered to have that type of space. So again, uh, gratitude, extreme gratitude for that question and pointing out your father's uh, uh, alma mater, Stora College, which sadly is no, no longer with us, which again, I think is a, uh, a should serve as a reminder of the critical importance of financially supporting these institutions, but also as, as Brandon mentioned, also um, seeking reparations in the sense of saying, uh, look, you know, pay us what you owe us. The federal government, state government has deliberately underfunded these institutions for years. Um, to that last question, without question, Black history uh, and understanding our sense of self is so vitally important. This is one of the, the way, one of the reasons why um, that, that one of the first and most important components of what I argue in my book is the second curriculum, race consciousness. Uh, again, that was something which uh, permeated throughout the, the Black college space for years, and, and I would argue still does. Again, students deliberately attend these institutions because they want a strong sense of themselves. And that's it's not just something that they get from the classes and courses that, that they take, but iron sharpens iron. And many of these students are impacted by the relationships and conversations they have with one another. Um, the, the, the countless information, you know, we live in this information age and so many of them are sharing that information with their fellow students. Um, via social media and other posts that they might make. So, uh, but incorporating and embracing and ingesting all of that while living and socializing and, and, and going through this maturation process while, while uh, being encapsulated by a black college, it makes a very profound impact. So uh, on black studies, black history, um, the teaching and, and administering of those uh, lessons that you learn from those subjects have never been more important. You know, I think it was um, extremely sad to see this morning when I woke up the story that uh, um, President Trump has uh, now gutted uh, any type of race training within the federal government. Uh, so uh, again, these are the type of uh, uh, battles that we are currently encountering. And so again, we need students being produced from these institutions who can counter those type of messages, who are trained, who are, who are equipped with the intellectual tools to take on these type of detractors, uh, and dare I say these type of enemies, because there are indeed a number of people who believe that, uh, uh, again, the mythology of who we are as a country uh, is the true narrative. Uh, and I think it's dangerous, and I think it's important Important that students understand um, the real lessons of the past. Uh, and Black colleges have often played a critical role in being a space where those lessons can, be, can indeed be administered. I'll just add uh, to that question. Um, it's important for us to understand that, you know, I like to talk about these new political ages. Uh, and it's important to under, for us to understand that this is a new political age that we're facing. On the other hand, citizenship, and particularly the citizenship rights, the civil rights of African Americans, has always been challenged uh, in, in citizenship in American society in many ways, has always been tenuous for so many people, right? And African Americans are the best representation of how that citizenship has been tenuous. Um, and it, it's also important for us to understand um, the, the relationship between uh, how black citizenship and efforts to suppress black citizenship has always been um, under the guise of, of white supremacy and capitalism. So just beyond African-American citizenship, we have to understand those historic relationships uh, and understand that while for us, this seems uh, as if it's the, the, the worst moment in American history, I assure you that it is not. Um, but we have to sort of look to history to understand the strategies that have been used and understand that uh, folks who have been marginalized in American society have always always resisted, has al have always challenged, and have always asserted um, their humanity and their uh, rights to be a part of this society. And I think that's important for us to understand in this moment. As much as, as and even myself, as much as I've been, uh, I've had my moments where I've been, just been discouraged by the moment, I also have to be encouraged by the narratives of history, right? Uh, the understanding of, 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 of how a people ha has, have continuously um, uh, represented and, and stood uh, for 
the possibilities of what American democracy should be. Right? And that's some, some, something for us to sort of take with us. Um, I think it's also important, the question about um, African-American history being studied within the context of American history. If, if you're teaching and studying American history and African-American history isn't a significant aspect of that, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and I would, would argue that you can teach African-American history, or, or let me just say this, African-American history is American history first, uh, but those of us who've, who've taught African-American history have always taught it as American history. Folks, many folks who've taught American history have, uh, have not always taught American history uh, with the narratives and stories and understandings of African-American history. So in many ways, folks who have been sort of teaching African-American history have always done that. That's never been a question for us. Uh, and so uh, as, as scholars, as historians, uh, it's our job to make sure that we help people understand that African American history is very is a much is a is as much a part of uh, you should have the uh, you should have the same kind of strong feelings about African American history as you do the, the 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 sort of this larger narrative, right? Because it's your history too. African American history is all of our histories, uh, and so I just want to sort of make those uh, particular points. I think it's important for us us to understand uh, black citizenship and the challenges uh, that African Americans have always faced. Uh, in, the, in these new political moments. Well, wow, thank you, gentlemen, so very much. That's, we've literally been taken to church and, and I'm going to get three credit hours out of this talk today, but absolutely amazing. Um, and, and, you know, Professor Favors, iron sharpens iron. That needs to be on t-shirts just and, and worn every place possible. So one final question for you all before we wrap up, um, and Kat would like to know, what are you working on now and what comes next for the both of you? So I'm, I'm going in a completely different direction um, with my next monograph um, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer looking um, simply at institutions. Um, but I'm actually using uh, an 1898 lynching case, um, Frazier Baker um, from Lake City, South Carolina. Um, Frazier Baker uh, in 1898, along with his one-year-old daughter, um, they were lynched uh, in Lake City, South Carolina because he was a black postmaster uh, and, and the white citizens of that town um, did not want to receive their mail from a black man, but they saw him increasingly as a threat. Uh, and so I'm looking at um, whiteness uh, and how whiteness has often reacted in a very violent, hostile way when it feels as though it was threatened uh, and using the Frazier Baker case um, as an example. Um, Frazier Baker, because he was a black postmaster, this actually produced uh, a federal case, which was extremely rare in 1898 to, for, a, for the federal government to step in uh, and to have a, a case dealing with lynching. Um, but it became an international affair. Uh, it became a catalyst for the early civil rights movement. Uh, to date, um, there has not been a book length study uh, on, on the impacts of this case. Um, so that's the next direction um, that I, I am going in is, is exposing the history of, of that case, but also what it teaches us about whiteness and how it often responds uh, when it feels as though it's under threat. And I believe that we can currently see um, in today's contemporary society um, how that is playing out. So I also hope to draw some very contemporary analysis uh, as I conclude that study moving forward. So, uh... Some of what I, I hope uh, gets done in uh, along the lines of history is I, I do believe that um, more recently historians like Evan Falkenberry have, have written about the Vert Education Project, uh, which was under the um, leadership of the Southern Regional Council. I do think there needs to be a uh, comprehensive and book length project uh, specifically on the Southern Regional Council, in particular, uh, the role of African American leaders within the organization. Uh, so at, at some point, maybe I'll, I'll take on a history of the Southern Regional Council. I do have ideas for that. Um, but my current book project uh, stems from my first book on John Wheeler, the banker. So this next project uh, is uh, a comprehensive, 
is uh, provisionally titled um, uh, A History of African American, History of Black Banking Since 1865. And so with that project, I hope to provide uh, a more a fuller narrative and a fuller comprehensive history of black banking in the American South using banks like John, bankers like John Herbert Wheeler and banks like the Mechanics and Farmers Bank in Durham to really sort of um, tell this, this broader story. Oftentimes when we talk about black banking, uh, we oftentimes talk about it uh, in terms of, yes, uh, they had success, uh, but these institutions did not, many of them did not survive. And with the coming of integration, um, we pivot to uh, a different kind of, of narrative when we think of sort of the, um, the larger marketplace. And so oftentimes we talk about this history, um, they end it with the coming of integration and we move along. But what I wanna do is recenter uh, the stories of, of black banks, um, looking at the stories of the bankers, the, the, the employees, the officers, the managers, the customers, um, which represent a cross section of class from uh, domestics to professional African Americans. Uh, and then, and so really sort of capturing um, in these demo, within these demographics, uh, this story of black banking, right? Who are these people? Why was the black bank or in what ways did the black bank, although uh, we understand that the resources by 1959 of all black banks uh, was around $48 million. There are 15,000 banks in operation in the United States at this particular time. The resources of black banks was a small part of that, but within the African-American communities and where these banks actually existed and operated, they were important institutions for African-Americans in terms of uh, home ownership, in terms of facilitating the, uh, uh, the building of, of churches and things of that nature. So these institutions for African-Americans were, were vitally important, but I think all too often, because of their limited resources, we tend to ignore their impact and, and almost as if uh, they did not matter up against this larger, uh, the larger marketplace, the larger American society. So what I wanna come do is, is retell these stories, uh, give it some, um, really sort of tell it from a social, political and economic perspective uh, and really sort of help, under, help us understand the networks of black banking in, in these institutions that uh, were in operation in cities like Durham, in Nashville, in Memphis, in Birmingham, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, in Richmond, Virginia. How, how, what's the relationship between all of these institutions? And I'm, I'm covering some very, uh, really some really engaging, interesting stories uh, about these institutions. And so uh, I, I hopefully in the next few years, uh, you'll, you'll see that book coming out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Professors Favors and Winford, for those inspirational and, and powerful statements that you made, and, and as well as the books that you've given us to read. Once again, Karis Books and More um, will be sending copies to you all via mail if you order them of both Shelter in the Time of Storm and the John Hervey Wheeler book. Karis Books and More is, of course, one of the oldest feminist bookstores in the United States that is still operational. They have been soldiering on during this pandemic, uh, delivering books by mail, like many of the independent bookstores who do curbside pickup, who do books to your home. I encourage you all to support our independent booksellers. I encourage you to support black independent bookstores and black owned businesses. I encourage you all to look deeper into history, to look deeper into Lillian Smith and what she wished to accomplish. Like Dr. McKaney said in her comments in the chat, I also encourage us all to practice empathy and that we learn about black history. We learn about black stories because black history matters, black stories matter, and black lives matter. Thank you all so very much. And we will see you all again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you all.